Uh, welcome to TIE 2016. Um, thanks to HCC, our vendors, CES volunteers, and other volunteers, and the work of the TIE PLC um, for putting this conference on. I'd especially like to thank Casey Dagel Matos, Sarah Bates, and Sapphire DeYoung. They are the backbone of this conference, and everything that you see happening is because of them. located near the elevator on each floor. There's coffee and pastries in the vendor area. If there's any possibility that you would like to receive PDPs for attending today, um, you must sign in and sign out at the registration table. Um, and you also have to sign in to the HCC guest computer network. And if you don't know how to do that, you can visit the registration table and they will get you all signed on. Um, lunch is at 12.30 in the cafeteria, and there's networking in the vendor area. There will be a Computer Science Teachers Association rep available at lunch. Look for the tables with the um, little sparkly balloon weights on them. We do have a raffle. Um, how to submit the raffle is you visit every vendor and get a stamp. Acer was not able to come today, so you don't have to um, get their stamp. And you have to put it, um, the completed passport in the box on the CES table, which is located directly across from the registration table. The drawing will be held at four in the vendor area, and you must be present to win. And we have um, an Apple TV, we have an iPad, we have a number of year-long subscriptions to services, um, so there's, and a Chromebook, so there's some great prizes. And there'll also be some refreshments in the vendor area. Um, I'd like to introduce Bill Deal, the Executive Director of the board. So first we have to add to the thanks for this conference, Angela Burke, our Technology Director. So, so welcome to TIE 2016. My role is to introduce the collaborative and then our, our keynote speaker. Uh, and this is a really exciting conference, if you've seen the whole uh, layout of the course of the classes and the workshops that we presented. It's a really exciting time. Same time education, especially for technology education. We're really pleased to collaborate and play a key role in helping promote technology education uh, throughout the region and especially with our member school districts. So CES is a membership collaborative as all, all collaboratives in the state. We have 36 member school districts, which is almost all the districts in Franklin, Hampshire County. We also work with uh, districts in Hamley County, Cochu, and around the whole Commonwealth. We do a range of things. We, uh, we were describing it last night to Arturo, and he was, I think, pretty amazed at the range of activities we're engaged in, uh, ranging from early child education, parent workshops, family centers, uh, through after school programs. We have a lot of special education services. Uh, we do a lot of professional development and licensure activities after school, etc. We do a whole range of things, especially focused on our member school districts and other districts in the area. The role of all the collaboratives in the Commonwealth are to do things collaboratively that individual districts would have trouble doing on their own. And part of that is technology. So we can present these kind of conferences, we can provide all kinds of support to districts uh, in their technology needs, and are always anxious to do so. So our technology department is kind of at your, at your call to help with all kinds of different uh, things you might need with technology and education. So, that said, let me introduce our speaker. Antor Garcia, who is right sitting right there, we had pleasure having dinner with him last night. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the English department at Colorado State University. Prior to coming to Colorado, he was an English teacher at a public high school in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, and there he co-founded the Critical Design and Gaming School, a school I wish I could have gone to. It's a public high school based around principles of gaming. Arturo also completed his PhD in Urban Schooling Division of the Graduate School of Education Information Studies at UCLA. His research focuses primarily on developing critical literacy and civic identity for the use of participatory media and gameplay in formal learning environments. And I think he'll unpack that sentence for you in this talk. In 2008, he co-developed the Black Cloud Game. It's a digital media and learning competition award recipient. A black cloud provokes students to take real-time assessment of air quality in their community. They use custom-developed sensors that measure and send quality about air, some data about air quality 
They critically analyze the pollution in their, in their communities and they make recommendations to city officials. He's a 2010 and 2011, 2014-15 U.S. Department of Education Teaching Ambassador Fellow, providing teacher input and feedback on national education policy initiatives. His research has appeared in numerous journals, including, I'm glad to say, the Harvard Education Review, um, Teachers College Record, English Journal, and others. He's, a, he's the author of several books. Uh, his two most recent ones are Doing Youth Participatory Action Research, which uh, is at the conference for sale, and Pose, this is my favorite title of all, Pose Wobble Flow, a, a culturally proactive approach to literacy and instruction. And I think the best actually introduction of him is written on the back of this book by one of our, our friends, and many of you know her, Sonia Nieto, who's a UMass professor, uh, who said, this beautiful book will educate, challenge, and inspire educators determined to improve their teaching. This is what he does. So I'm very delighted to introduce Victoria C. I tweet once in a while, so if you want to bug me with questions, because we probably won't have time today uh, or during this session, um, send, me a, send me a tweet, or, or not, that's all right too. Um, so, Bill, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, a little bit more about me, I, I'm really good at sitting in traffic since I spent you know, the better part of a decade in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm currently reading Super Mutant Magic Academy uh, and Participatory Culture in a Networked Era. Uh, so like, usually I read like a fun book and a not so fun book, uh, but they're both pretty fun. Um, so I think it's useful to kind of introduce, like, who are you based on what's on your shelf right now. Uh, I also play a lot of games. I'm currently playing Netrunner. Uh, it is uh, an asymmetric living card game. Uh, I didn't really know what that meant either. It was also very complicated. My wife and I were playing it wrong for the first month, so that says something about either my, my gaming literacy skills uh, or the complexity of that game. Um, I also have been playing Pandemic Legacy, and I will tell you about how great that is at another time if you're interested. Um, but I would like for you, usually we sit here and maybe there's a creepy person next to you, take one minute just to introduce yourself to the person next to you, tell them what you're reading or playing, and uh, say hello for a second. becoming of the young people we work with. And this is um, a Bakhtinian notion, Bakhtin, uh, and trying to think through um, ideological becoming. I think it's a useful way for us to think through how are we shaping young people with the tools and digital stuff that happens in classrooms and informal environments, right? And then along with that, what's our responsibility? As the educators in the room, what kind of role do we play with this? And there'll be some conversation along those two lines along the way. Um, to do that, I want to start with a quote, uh, which is where the title from today's talk comes from. Uh, this is the first sentence of a famous a science fiction novel. The sky above the port was the color of a television tuned to a dead channel. Does anyone know what this is? Like you're like screaming in your head, you know this book? I did. I heard something. Uh, it's Neuromancer by William Gibson. Uh, so, so 1984. Good book. Uh, interesting first sense. And I think this is an interesting way to kind of think through like the setting and tone and, and how that setting and tone of both in the book and in our own world is tied to the world around us. I like the young adult version of this from the book Feed. Uh, we went to the moon to have fun, but the moon turned out to completely suck. The first sentence of that book also. Um, I think we can kind of think through how we shape expectations. And, I, and with this sentence, I think about how does 
uh, the way adult authority oftentimes get in the way in the interest of young people. Um, and so I would share, this is a photo of my principal's desk when I was teaching in South Central Los Angeles, right? And basically the principal, the assistant principals and the security went around just took all of the earbuds and, and headphones from the students at the beginning of school and said you can get it uh, after, after the school ends. I don't really know how you like, oh this one, this one's mine. <laughs> I don't really know how the students get those back afterwards. Uh, one, I think it's a, like, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to boast or anything, but I think there's a beautiful modern art picture, right? This is, this is my entry into uh, MoMA or something someday in the future. Um, but I think it speaks volumes to the ways we can think about educational policy around technology, youth interests conflicting with adult interests, and what the kinds of tensions are around these. Um, so that being said, what I want us to think about today are the kinds of journeys we're going on in schools and with technology. That's going to be uh, what I'm focusing on for, for today's talk. Um, so if we think about this journey, there's a lot of stuff uh, that we're floating on, right? The kind of flotsam and jetsam that, that is moving us along. Uh, Colorado's a park state. I don't know if, if Massachusetts is a park or Smarter Balance, the butter or whatever it is. Um, so, or, so yeah, fair enough, right? <laughs> It'll be different tomorrow anyway, so don't worry about it. Um, so I want to start by talking about young adult literature. I've thought about the role of young adult literature with young people, and particularly young adult literature tied to um, technology. If you don't like young adult literature, boo books, then just, uh, just check your phone for a minute. We'll, we'll be in a second. Um, so I want to start with a novel that came out a couple years ago called Fangirl by Rainbow Rowell. Has anyone read this book? Yeah, awesome. English teachers probably in the room. No, nice work. My um, so Fangirl uh, is about a girl, they're, they're twins, Kath and Rin. Catherine, hey. Um, and Kat and Rin um, goes to university, and in her spare time, she is one of the world's most popular fan fiction writers. And she's essentially writing fan fiction um, in a fictional world that's basically uh, her imagining of the end of a Harry Potter-like character named Simon Snow. Um, and very popular. And so that book came out a couple years ago. Uh, over the summer, or earlier this year, or earlier 2015, um, this book, Carry On, came out, which essentially is the fan fiction from within this book. Right? There's small excerpts within Fangirl, but the whole book itself is imaginary fan fiction of a book that doesn't exist that happened within Fangirl. Um, as a side, I'd say, I'd say Rainbow Rose did some really interesting things where each of her books somehow has some kind of nostalgic reference back to technology. Uh, and, and this is an instantiation of that, from landline phones to email attachments to uh, Sony Walkman um, cassette players, and this is this is another instantiation of that. Right? Uh, when I heard, when I heard Rainbow Royal talk about this at the San Diego Comic Con, um, she pointed to her reading of fan fiction really influencing her writing process. She pointed to the Paradox si series, uh, so fan fiction fans might know, know of this. Um, but the Paradox series uh, is essentially slash fan fiction, uh, so homosexual related fan fiction um, about the current BBC uh, Sherlock series. Um, and it's actually really good if you're looking for some fun fan fiction, read the Paradox Suite. Don't read it to your students, it's not work appropriate. Um, so I, I would say before, before Rainbow Row wrote Carry On, she was beaten to the punch. If you go on to fanfiction.net, there is already fan fiction of this imaginary fan fiction that, that people were writing, right? And you can see these are long, right? This one is uh, 17,000 words. I have, I have a pointer. This is great. I can, can do that all day. Um, this is 105,000 word fan fiction of Carry On Simon Snow, right? This is uh, young people and adults alike being influenced by Rimbaud's writing and writing their own fact, fan fiction long before she was doing this, right? And I would just, just note that fan fiction is awesome, right? If you go onto fanfiction.net and just look at um, the different options. This is just a slide of uh, marching band fan fiction. If you're looking for some fan fiction about marching bands, there's fan fiction about Tetris. I think that's great. Um, I want us to think about the fact that fan fiction is real fiction, right? The ways that we blur the lines between, oh, this isn't real because this is someone paying homage to or being influenced by other work. That's, that's ridiculous, right? This is how we as cultural producers make writing. Right? in all kinds of contexts. And I think this is an important space. We're going to return to this notion in a second, too. Right? So a couple questions I want to think about. What does fan fiction tell us about youth reading and engagement in terms of the ways we engage in these spaces? And what lessons about ownership, authority, and identity are cultivated through fan fiction? So let me tell you another story. Uh, and right before my talk, I found out that Alan Rickman passed away, which is a real bummer. Uh, and so, but we're still going to talk about Harry Potter. It's too bad. Um, so I want to talk about in fan fiction, 
uh, the most popular fan fiction, unsurprising, is Harry Potter fan fiction, right? Earlier last year, uh, there was over 726,000 different fan fiction stories on one website alone about Harry Potter, right? And there's many other sites that, that are doing this. Um, so I want to share one story from within this. Uh, so move over Harry Potter. This is going to be a story where Draco uh, is the, the central character within this fan fiction. Um, this story is called the Draco Trilogy. There's three book-length works that were published between 2000 and 2006. A um, couple of tropes that came out. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about um, the Draco Trilogy. So the Draco Trilogy imagines first day of potions class. Um, Harry and Draco take potions and accidentally switch identities for the day. There's a love triangle with Hermione. Um, but ultimately, uh, instead of being the kind of sniveling and weak guy that Draco is often portrayed in, in both the books and the films, Draco is this kind of cool, standoffish guy who has a much closer bond with Harry Potter in the series. Um, through that, there's a couple of tropes that came out through this. Has anyone read the Draco trilogy, by the way? It's interesting. If you're looking for some, you're like, I need some more stories about uh, Draco. This is this is for you. Um, so some fan fiction tropes. Uh, the relationships in this are het they they relate to heterosexual relationships. Um, however, there are Harry slash Draco undertones within this. So there's some longing glances maybe between uh, Harry and Draco throughout the story. Um, and and in that sense, it might be related to slash fiction. So I need to take a second and explain slash fiction. Because that's what you do uh, when you get to talk to a bunch of educators. Um, so slash fiction uh, refers to uh, fan fiction in which two characters who are of the same sex are involved in a romantic re relationship, where in the actual story they usually are not. Right? The history of where slash comes from is really interesting. If you look back to uh, the rise of Star Trek in popularity uh, and, and nerd culture around Star Trek, there are lots of stories where they're really interested uh, in Kirk and Spock being in a relationship together, right? Obviously, right? Um, and so there were so many stories that they just started calling them Kirk slash Spock stories, right? Uh, and ultimately, they realized, oh, we could just use the slash and say two characters side by side uh, that are the same sex are then slash fiction, right? So this is where this idea of slash fiction comes from. Um, and it's become a big trope. Um, there's some really interesting slash fiction tied to the new Star Wars film, uh, if you're, if you're uh, interested in looking on Tumblr. Okay, Harry slash Draco. There's a whole uh, Wikipedia page entry on this, uh, lots of tropes around this. My favorite trope that came out of this is Draco in leather pants. Uh, what this trope is, is Draco in leather pants uh, refers to Draco, again, instead of being this like weak, nerdy guy, is a cool guy in leather pants in the Draco trilogy. Uh, and now this is a trope that points to any time a fan fiction story takes a character who isn't seen as cool, is seen as weak, is seen as not uh, a stronger, empowered character, and, and flips that and changes them into someone who's very strong and, and represents their agency very strongly, uh, is, is seen as Draco and other fans. Um, but this is where the problem begins. So throughout the stories, um, the author of the Draco trilogy was accused uh, of plagiarism and of lifting whole phrases from other books, right? So you can see um, this is Draco Sinister, the third book in the series, and the bold parts you can see almost exactly like certain certain phrases showing up back and forth between these. I really like this uh, clicker. This is great. Uh, so there's some there's some people complaining that this person had plagiarized this work in fan fiction, and not from Harry Potter, from Pamela Dean's The Hidden Land, so fantasy novel. Um, the author said, all I can say is that beyond never hiding the fact that quotes in the stories are taken from Buffy, Monty Python, Red Dwarf, and so on, I've clearly stated in my, in my disclaimers for the stories, there have been multiple and in-depth discuss discussions on POU, a, a fan fiction site, about the quotes with people having fun identifying them and even have an unofficial quote nabbing game with some of my fellow authors. Right? So she's saying, this part of my process is right. But the, the kind of complaints around this uh, continue over and over, uh, and the Draco trilogy was removed from the internet. Of course, you, two Google searches and you can download the PDF of all of these, right? But, uh, but she, she took it away, right? I'm gonna take my toys and go home. Um, and she was never heard of again. Um, and, and as a result of this, uh, they gave her a name, the author of this, they called her She Who Must Not Be Named, right? Uh, referring to Voldemort in some sense. Um, but I'm here to tell you the name. This is why I came here today. Um, so, the author of the Draco trilogy is someone named Cassandra Clare. Um, she changed the last name, her spelling of her last name from here to uh, later on. She wrote the City of Bones series and the many books around that. There is now currently an ABC TV show. There is a movie. There's been over 10 million copies of the book sold. And we can think through how her writing of fan fiction was almost a training ground 
for her to be uh, a very profitable young adult author, right? The processes of quote nabbing, of using other people's work, of building on the world that someone else had created, allowed her to create another fairly similar work with fantasy and vampires and, and uh, fantasy tropes within this other universe, right? So some questions I'm thinking about with this process. Who's left out when fan fiction is a capitalist training ground, right? Uh, so Cassandra Clare was able to use fan fiction as a way for her to become a very successful and rich author, right? And what's the role of agency, literacy construction, and racial identity within these works, right? I want to think through the racial pieces, right? So in relation to that, um, I was struck by the Star Wars monopoly and the brouhaha that has, I've never said the word brouhaha until right now. <laughs> so very, so very self-conscious about that. Um, but the, so this is Star Wars monopoly that came out for Force Awakens. Um, you'll recognize that the main female character of the film uh, is not one of the four characters that was originally offered with Star Wars Monopoly. Um, spoiler alert, that guy's not in the new Star Wars film, but they made him a, a toy figure instead of the main female character, right? Uh, other spoiler alert, that guy's in the film for like 10 seconds. Um, so we can think through, um, hey, also if you haven't seen Star Wars yet, you should go see it. Um, because, because I'm going to spoil it. Everyone dies. Um, <laughs> We can think through what this means, right? Here's a letter that someone sent to Hasbro, a young girl, uh, Annie Rose, at age eight. Uh, how could you leave out Ray? She belongs in Star Wars Monopoly and all the other Star Wars games. Without her, there is no Force Awakens. Right? I think that's the best response to thinking through, you know, who makes the decisions about what is the stuff that we're interacting with? How is that related to fan fiction? Right? If we look at the relationships with Ray, with the Tumblr community, with fan fiction communities, it's an entirely different trope than how marketers are thinking about this as well. Right? I think this is the real challenge we need to be thinking through. So I want to offer another perspective of this if we think about the counter narratives that are emerging. Right? Uh, the Hunger Games, uh, if people haven't read The Hunger Games or seen the films, I'm going to ruin them right now. Um, so again, just put, on your head, put on your headphones if they haven't been taken away, uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through this. So I want to start by looking at a meme. Um, Memes are those things that go viral on the internet. Um, there's three parts to this meme. It is a Tumblr page, right? So it'll be something on tumblr.com that gets circulated over and over. Um, so that's the first part is that you know where it comes from. The second part, it's going to be six GIFs or GIFs, however you want to pronounce it. I think Obama calls them GIFs. I'm going to go with that. Um, so there's going to be six of these. They're going to be stills from the, the movie that are showing a key sequence in the film. And then there's going to be comments underneath it. Those GIFs and the comments underneath it all move together, right? Th that was all a part of the meme. So I want to look at the GIFs first, right? Uh, so this is the end of the first film, or near the end. Um, we see Thresh uh, from District 12, District 11, um, attacking the girl from District 2, saying, uh, did you kill her? No, he kills her. And at the very end, he sees Katniss. He could kill Katniss. And he says, just this time, 12 for Rue. Do people remember this part of the film? Okay. Someone who remembers this part, can you tell me why he doesn't kill her? Some, can someone yell it out for me? Why does he not kill Katniss? Katniss took care of Rue. What's that? Katniss took care of Rue. Katniss took care of Rue, right? So he says it right here for Rue, right? So because Katniss protect, tried to, um, became very close with Rue, gave her the kind of same um, uh, respect in, uh, in her death that, that his district would pay for her, um, he, this is the only way he can repay her, right? And we can see that moment here. Okay. Um, and then there's the comments underneath it, and I want to look at these comments. First comment says, can we just stop and talk about this for a minute, this being this. Thresh doesn't make an alliance, Thresh doesn't waste time liking Katniss. Thresh knows that either he must kill her or she must kill him for one of them to win, but this is the only way he can repay her for protecting Rue when he couldn't. It's the only way he can repay her for honoring Rue when he couldn't. He honors her by sparing her friend. The girl would have died for her. The revolution really doesn't start with Katniss, it starts with Rue. And then somebody says, somebody finally said it. This is the second comment. There's a longer comment underneath. I'm going to look at excerpts of it. First part says, this is exactly the point I've been trying to make for years. OK, so the revolution gets to kindling with Katniss. She volunteers. As an English teacher, this goes into some awesome analysis. right? I'm like, oh, this is great. This is this common quarter line instruction. Nice work. Um, and then she goes on, but it changes the game is Rue. Right? And then there's some more. Uh, and, and says, the speech for Rue, Peter's painting. Everything alludes back to this one little girl who became Katniss's family. So revolution never started with Katniss. She was just the tender for Rue's ignition. Rue was the real Mockingjay. And I think this is a powerful reinterpretation of what Hunger Games is, who the main character is, and what the possibilities of seeing yourself within the book that Hunger Games can mean for young people. Right? This was circulated uh, in many different ways. Lots of people were engaging with this. 
Um, and I want to think about that in the context of what's happening in the civic world, right? If the Hunger Games is a space where people are thinking about uh, resisting government challenges, we think about what's that mean in an era of, of the kinds of social conflict that are happening in the world today, and young people's exposure to that kind of uh, conflict as well, right? So in that, I want to think about Amanda Steinberg. This is the young girl, who, this is the young woman who played uh, Rue. She's also a comic book writer right now, right? Um, and when the movie posters came out for the first Hunger Games, these were some of the tweets that came out. Why is Rue actually black? Not gonna lie, kind of ruined the movie. Sin and Rue weren't supposed to be black. Why did the producer make all the good characters black? Shaking my head. Call me racist, but when I found out Rue was black, I, her death wasn't as sad. I hate myself. Uh, Rue looks nothing like I imagined her. Isn't she supposed to be a pale redhead, or is that just in my head? Why is she black? For the record, I'm still pissed that Rue is black, like you think she might have mentioned that. Is that just me, or uh, there's a hashtag, stick to the book, dude. People are like, why are you changing this? Um, so, it's, uh, so let's stick to the book. I'm going to look at what it says in the first Hunger Games. Uh, and most hauntingly, a 12-year-old girl from District 11. She has dark brown skin and eyes, but other than that, she's very like prim in size and demeanor. Um, Bill did my introduction. I have a PhD, uh, and I was an English teacher. Um, and so I may not be the best reader in the world, but when, but when I read this, I don't read white, right? Uh, dark brown skin to me has a very clear uh, connotation and denotation, right, as an English teacher, of what that means. Uh, and it definitely doesn't mean white. So we can think through, what does it mean when we can't imagine a character as black, even when the book says she is not white, right? Uh, I think about this in terms of Maxine Green's work on public imagination. Um, a scholar from Teachers College who passed away last year. Uh, Maxine Green wrote, Imagination is what, above all, makes empathy possible, who enables us to cross the empty spaces between ourselves and those we teachers have called other over the years. It allows us to break with the taken for granted to set aside familiar distinctions and definitions. And think about public imagination and the limitations of public imagination. When people are upset that Rue is black, that a stormtrooper is black, that Annie is black, we can think about this over and over, Johnny Storm. We think about how representations of race are challenged and contested in a world of imagination, right? And when an author makes a canonical choice around this too, right? I want to think about this again, returning to Harry Potter in terms of the mirror of Erised uh, from the first book of Harry Potter. Does anyone remember what the mirror does? Shows, yeah. Shows you <coughs> Go. Shows whatever you desire. Yeah, so you look in it, it shows you whatever you desire, right? Um, it shows your deepest, most desperate desire of our hearts, right, if you look into this mirror. Uh, and I would argue that in terms of the kinds of young adult reading choices for people today, uh, if you are a young white reader, right, you can look in the mirror of Erised and you can see regardless of your own identity, you can see yourself reflected in the young adult reading choices that are available to you. Right? These, are, these are choices that you can make. However, if you are a person of color, right, and you're looking into the reading choices, you can find some books that might deal with uh, identity and gender identity, but it'll be very limited. There aren't as many choices, so it'll be a distortion of your identity. Uh, you might see things that are, are historically re related to yourself, but again, it'll be limited. You won't see as robust the kinds of choices, right? Hopefully, if you are a young black reader, you like sports or games, because those are the kinds of books that are available to you. Right? And I think about this in terms of the descriptions of the Mirror of Erised. Man is wasted away before it, entranced by what they have seen, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. And I want to think about that in terms of James Baldwin says, you must consider what happens to life, to a life which finds no mirror. And I think this is an important part for us to think through our responsibility as educators in terms of pop culture, the references around us, how we engage with these spaces. Uh, I would think about the mirror right now, uh, Hermione, right? So we can think about right now, J.K. Rowling's written a two-part play uh, that will continue the world of Harry Potter. It will debut later this year in London. Um, people got very mad. Uh, when um, they, they, they acknowledge the casting and the person playing Hermione is a black actress. Again, people were upset about this. Uh, J.K. Rowling has come out and said, canon, what is official in the world of Harry Potter? Brown eyes, frizzy hair, and very clever. White skin was never specified. Rowling loves black Hermione because someone asked her what she thinks about um, the fact that Hermione is going to be black. Um, again, people on the internet are mad about something. Um, but when you think about what this means, if you are following the Tumblr community, uh, they have been drawing, describing Hermione as a, as, a, as a black girl for a long time now. 
Um, we can think through how does society pick up, challenge, contest these spaces, and what does our responsibility mean as educators, right? How do we read race into the choices we make, right? When we read novels, when we read texts, is it only the characters who aren't white that their racial characteristics are described? Right? Why is that? How do we point that, that out to young readers? What's our responsibility around this? How do we engage in dialogue with authors? Right? When someone like J.K. Rowling, <coughs> arguably one of the most popular authors in the world, uh, inarguably probably, one of the most, most popular authors in the world, is able to engage and answer questions around this, we have no excuse but to be able to be in these conversations both with fans, with our students, and with producers alike. I think these are the choices we have to be making. So, I want to flash back one year ago as I was thinking about uh, the Hunger Games, I was thinking about what's happening with Hermione, I was thinking about what's happening with Star Wars. Um, a year ago, I was on Twitter and I was thinking about Black Lives Matter, the way all of the people on Twitter were engaged in these conversations, and the way I was seeing these conversations move into real world demonstrations, right? The way technology was mediating the kinds of civic choices I could make as a, as a um, as a participant in, in civic life in Colorado. Right? I was feeling very uh, socially engaged in the kinds of uh, conversations that were happening here. But meanwhile, um, if, I, if I looked on Facebook, so I'm in Rome, um, if I looked on Facebook, what I mostly saw were most of um, my middle class, uh, primarily white friends dumping water on their heads. Uh, in a different kinds of civic conversation, right? There, and it's not to say that one is better than the other to privilege one over the other, but there are two very different populations and very different kinds of civic engagement that are parallel to each other and not in conversation with each other. And I think this was really challenging for me to think through. Um, what's this mean in terms of how young people are, are seeing these different spaces and the kinds of civic outcomes, I hear, I hear them, um, the kinds of civic outcomes that the young people are getting out of these spaces. So, some questions I want to think through as I switch gears here in a second. What are the vessels of rep representation that we are building, right? Uh, what's our responsibility? <laughs> Whose lives matter in the text that you teach? And how do you know, right? I think these are questions I want us to be thinking about. Um, I want to take, although the last time I asked you to talk to each other, it was hard to pull you back. Uh, but for reals this time, I want you to take two minutes, talk to that creepy person next to you that you already introduced yourself so they're less creepy now. Um, and just reflect what are questions you're thinking about, what, what's challenging you, what, what are you reflecting on. Take two minutes just to talk to the person next to you and do some unpacking for a second. Yeah, I think that's a, and if people didn't hear, right, this is the, how do you teach a text 
uh, about uh, racial diversity, for example, and if you have one or two students of color in that classroom, how do you make it so they don't feel uncomfortable so all the other students aren't looking to that student anytime you know, uh, signals of race are represented, right? I think that's a really important question to think about, right? And I think this comes down to like the ways that we foster relationships within our classrooms, right? How do we create spaces where people feel um, safe to have those conversations, right? And to be able to unpack that is, is also difficult, so I, I appreciate that sentiment. Um, we'll have more time to keep unpacking too, um, but I figure it'd be good to, to check in with all of you for a second. Okay, so I would ask, um, do you have a litmus test for the kinds of texts that you're using in your classrooms, right? Um, I like the Alison Bechtel test, right? This comes from um, Alison Bechtel's comic book uh, or comic strip. Um, but the Bechtel test essentially is in films and books, um, are there two characters uh, in a comic book, or sorry, in a, sorry, it's a comic book. Are there two characters, for example, in a film um, that are women that have a conversation with each other that's not about a relationship or about a guy? Right? Uh, and if you Google the Bechtel test and you look up how many uh, films do not pass this every year, it is staggering. Right? The kinds of the big Hollywood films, most of them do not pass the Bechtel test. Uh, and that is a useful thing for us to recognize and just think about. Right? Um, I'd also think about, uh, I want to show a, a 10 second clip. Go ahead and hit it, Steve. I may switch you to Zoloft or Lexapro. And twice a day instead of once. Have you been going to that support group I suggested? Support groups can be a great way for you to connect with people who are on the same journey. Give it a chance. Who knows, you might even find it enlightening. Truth is, very few people have been on Phalanxa for as long as Hazel has. We really don't know the long-term effects. Yes, Hazel. Right. Perhaps there's a scenario. No. All right. So I didn't, I didn't make this, right? There is a series of these on YouTube, uh, and it just shows, it's a, it, they're super cuts of all of the people of color in a film, and they're usually a minute or two long for, for very popular films like The Fault in Our Stars. Um, and I think it's useful for us to be aware of these, right? A film like this unpacks the invisibility um, of, of racial bias within these films, and what does that mean in terms of representation and portrayal? And again, particularly our students in these classrooms, if there's only one or two of them in there, right? How do they see themselves affirmed in the lives of the texts and choices that we use in our classrooms? How do we get those choices out there, right, in terms of technology? We could have conversations with our students around texts like this, right? What would that mean? I want us to think differently uh, about all of these issues, right? So. We usually talk about Steve Jobs and, and how great he is as an innovator, and I agree with all of that. There's lots of films about him. They're all uh, varying degrees of quality, right, depending on the film you're watching. Um, I want to look at a quick inventory of who Steve Jobs was based on that Steve Isaacson uh, uh, biography. Uh, so he wrote, Jobs was often bullied in middle school, in the middle of seventh grade. He gave his parents an ultimatum. I insisted they put me in a different school, he recalled. Financially, this was a tough demand. Uh, I was kind of bored for the first few years, this is Steve talking, so I occupied, my, occupied myself by getting into trouble. One time we set off an explosive under the chair of our teacher, Mrs. Thurman, we gave her a nervous twitch. Uh, Jobs' parents, uh, if you can't keep them interested, it's your fault, this is them talking to his teachers, right, so this is their responsibility. Uh, and they said, he wanted me to promise that I'd never, uh, this, this Steve Jobs talking about his father, uh, he wanted me to promise that I'd never use pot again, but I wouldn't promise. By senior year, Steve Jobs was also dabbling in LSD and hash, as well as exploring the mind-bending effects of sleep deprivation. Um, they also talked about, Steve Jobs is famous for his reality distortion field, right, that he would just kind of uh, enter a room in the Apple office uh, and, and kind of say how things were supposed to be, and even if it's in like an alternate reality uh, of what, how things could possibly be. Um, this, this, they actually use this phrase in Pixar, I think, as an homage to uh, Steve Jobs' uh, relationship and, and the ownership of, of Pixar. Um, so just a quick, um, a quick uh, breakdown, right? Uh, Steve Jobs was outspoken and often bored in school. Uh, he got in trouble a lot, uh, but his parents supported him and, and were able to uh, really push and make more demands on his education. Um, and he had a lot of recreational drug use, right? We can think about these as the, the, some of the pieces that led to the person um, who created the, the device that buzzes in my pocket, right? And, and um, has made a, an impact on the kinds of day-to-day -day usages that, that I interact with. 
Um, but let's imagine um, if we were to take away this parental support, uh, and we're also to, to take away a white male privilege, right? Uh, if Steve Jobs wasn't white, and these were the kinds of factors, right? He is a loud person in school uh, who gave his teacher a nervous twitch with, by creating an explosion under uh, her desk, uh, got in trouble, and used drugs. Right? We can imagine the kind of person that Steve Jobs might have been. We could see that person possibly described in a book like Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. Right? We think about the school to prison pipeline and how Steve Jobs' uh, civic outcome and the kind of life path that he created would be very different if not for race. And this would be a useful way for us to think about um, the kinds of leaders in the Silicon Valley right, right now. Right? So Steve Jobs, uh, Larry Page, and, and, Serge, and um, Bryn Sergi, right? the, the Google guys. We can think about... Um, Elon Musk, the Tesla guy who, who suits rockets into the moon. Uh, when you think about all of these people, Jeff Bezos, and the ways that white male privilege plays a role in their kind of success, right? And we should be able to unpack this in terms of what does it mean to be an innovator and the kinds of STEM conversations around technology that we have today, right? I want to think about this in terms of uh, my friend and colleague, this is Travis. Um, Travis was my guiding teacher when I was a student teacher, and for eight years I taught next to him uh, in the classroom next to him. He was our ninth grade English teacher uh, in South Central Los Angeles, and I taught most of the time the 11th and 12th graders that he taught as ninth graders. Um, I really appreciated that uh, Travis had this poster in all of the classrooms that he taught. It said, what if your teacher is wrong? I think that's a useful, very lo-fi approach um, to having students kind of question their positionality and identity within classrooms. So Travis was teaching uh, Night by Elie Wiesel. This is a Holocaust memoir. Do people know this book? Okay. If you don't, um, you should read it. It's a good book. But I also think it's a, it's a good ninth grade uh, English book because the, um, it's, it's nonfiction. It is good, kind of clear denotation. Uh, the, the diction is clear for young people to engage in. And there's some clear symbolism. Being able to teach uh, literary devices in this book is, is very useful. So I think it's a good book. The challenge is Travis is trying to figure out how to engage his students in South Central. Um, we had only black and Latinos that are black and Latino students at our school. Um, how is he going to get them to engage in the Holocaust? And so he came up with a thought experiment. He said, "Imagine that people of color got together and decided that white people of European descent have had control of this land for 500 years and have not done much to preserve its resources or benefit most of its people. Therefore, as of tomorrow, all white people and people of white descent will be rounded up for deportation. Their property will be redistributed amongst people of color." And he just tells the students. What do you do? Right? This was his kind of opening thought experiment to make sure um, students could then think about this as an outcome and then move into night. We, we can critique this, that's fine. Um, we're not going to today. Um, but this was his opening activity. The first responses were lethal. One student said, if all the white people were gone, then we could live in their nice houses. A male student said there would be job openings. And another student said that people of color would have to run the government and make fair laws. A moment of concern came when a student said she could not do without M&M, &M, uh, and this prompted students to worry about white relatives. And then the mood shifted. And a student said, if there are no white people, then everything's going to be dirty. Many students agreed. And then there's another student said there'd be no more doctors. The class agreed. Then the student said there'd be no more PlayStations or inventions. And I remember the day that Travis told me this story. I remember Travis came in during passing period, right, as we're getting ready. He's like, I gotta tell you what happened. And we're both just floored, right, by, by this explanation. This wasn't where he thought the conversation was gonna go. And, it, and this is the story that I think continues to stay with me about the lessons of urban youth and the ways our schools are treating them and the ways our responsibilities as teachers sometimes feels invisible, right? There's no textbook in ninth grade or, or any grade before that that students can read in the textbook on page 17 um, that, uh, if, that if you are a person of color, you make the world dirty, right? There's no app out there that when you swipe it or you click on the right button, it tells you that as a person of color, you can't invent things, right? This is the hidden curriculum that over um, the first nine years of student schooling is imprinted upon them upon the kinds of educational opportunities that they see around them, the kinds of lessons that they see in the media, right? And the kinds of ways that they see adult mentors treating them. Right? This is where our civic responsibility comes from. Right? Our responsibility is to think through the challenges of what students are bringing into our classrooms right? that teachers like Travis are highlighting and thinking through our responsibility. Right? What do we do as an educational field and what's the role of technology around these pieces? 
right? This is another teacher uh, that Travis and I have worked with. This is my friend Mark. Um, Mark is, Mark is a, one of the other founding teachers at the Critical Design and Gaming School. Uh, both of them are teaching right now um, at CDAGS. Um, unless, unless one of them is sick or something, right? I don't, I don't really know. I didn't, I didn't call them today to make sure. Also, I think it's early over there. But they will be teaching at the school today, uh, unless something has gone drastically wrong. Um, and I want to think through the other part of this responsibility, right? So Mark oftentimes just texts me, gives me updates. Uh, on what's happening at the school. Uh, one of his very eloquent texts, yeah, I'm super, I'm tired, bro, super tired. Um, Mark is a blogger, edforchange.com is his blog. Um, and I wanna look at, um, I'll, I'll back up and say before we opened his high school, Mark was teaching the middle school students uh, at the middle school that fed into the school that Travis and I were teaching at before we all worked together and created this other school in the same part of the community. Uh, so in October last year, uh, Mark wrote this blog post, celebrating a life, a different kind of homecoming. Today, a community came together as they have many times before to celebrate the life of a young man taken too early. This young man, Elijah Galbraith, was loved by many. That was evident today as the services at Belula Baptist Church in Watts left standing room only for folks who came to their respects to Elijah and his family. The last day I spoke to Elijah, I celebrated, however momentarily, in those minutes during passing period, his accomplishments. He was improving and moving the needle forward on his academic meter. He was honing in on a focused pursuit of his goals to play football and attend college. Today, when we spoke to Elijah, we celebrated the same thing. We're proud of his life, though so very short and so unnecessarily violent in the end. But it is the possibilities in life that keep us coming back. And I want us to think about, this is the other part about our responsibility as educators, right? How do we work through the challenges of working in urban contexts? How do we work through the challenges of the different kinds of life circumstances that students are bringing into our classrooms? How do we mediate these in ways that create powerful civic opportunities for young people and powerful academic outcomes for young people? Right? How do we sustain our work? Right? I think about Mark's text, right? I'm super tired. Right? This, is, this is because Elijah isn't the only student that, that we've lost due to gun violence in the South Central community. Right? How does Mark get up every day? He's got a family of three, just had a new baby. Right? How does he get up every day and go to school with this, this, this sense of peril, right? knowing that he might lose a student at any given time? Right? How does he sustain his work? Right? And that of our friends and family and colleagues. Right? I want to look at a Twitter conversation I was having in Colorado with another teacher. Right? Um, so this is um, a brand new teacher uh, in, in Colorado um, that I've been working with. And she sent me a direct <coughs> message on Twitter now that there's not 140 characters in there on that. She said, uh, hey, so one of my students who was never around was shot yesterday morning. She's in the hospital. Uh, don't know more than that. Considering you've probably dealt with this and worse, uh, what do you do to cope in times like this? It's unfamiliar, unfamiliar territory to this privileged white girl. Uh, frowny face, I guess we, I don't know, you call that frowny face? Sure. Um, and then I said, you can see my, my beautiful picture here. Um, if this is common knowledge for your students, they probably need some place to talk, ask questions, feel safe. Uh, you don't need to be an expert, but you do, you do need to cope. You should see if you can visit after you can see if you can visit the student after school at all. Make sure there's a counselor who knows, and that his or her services are available. If students are aware of what's happening, I'm sure they will be. Uh, moving on to typical lesson plans probably isn't the right move until after some class discussion. Talk with your AP or principal about how you how you're feeling. See if there's any support there. Uh, it's okay to be upset and sad and uncertain. It would be weird not to, right? We can critique my grammar. That's fine. Um, but you, you can kind of see the kind of thinking that was going through in this conversation um, and the way digital media allowed us to have that. Um, she responds back to this, right? We aren't supposed to talk about it in the class because the family has requested as much privacy as possible for the time being. I haven't heard about it from my kids, uh, and this student isn't close with anyone in my class, I don't think. School staff is being great about directing. I'm more asking for advice on how to personally cope with it since it's a really foreign and difficult experience. Right? I think about this in terms of my response, right? If I look at my response, it wasn't until the very end that I kind of briefly mentioned, hey, you should be okay with being upset, like you have your own feelings, right? As a profession, we're really good at going into this kind of triage mode of, okay, here's what I need to do for my students, right? There's a lot of responsibility, it's a difficult time, I'm worried about the well-being of my students, and that's important, right? I understand why we do that, but I don't think, particularly in our relationship with technology and with our students, we do a very good job of thinking through what's our relationship to ourselves and our own kind of mental and public health. Right? Um, I know my kids leave rough lives and that they've lost people close to them and so forth, but this is the first time I've seen a student get hurt and it opened up a world of vulnerability for me mentally, especially since I've gotten close with one of my students who's in a game. 
right? I think about the missing lessons of what we're doing in terms of professional development and our responsibility with young people and teaching responsibilities for ourselves, right? We get up every morning, right? We have these kinds of challenges we think through. And even if you're not in a community where there is gun violence, right? You, you are gonna have other kinds of challenges like this with the students that you're gonna worry about, right? And if you're not worried about them, that doesn't seem very human, right? Like it's our responsibility to have this kind of empathy that we carry with us. If you can shut that out and come home at the end of the day, uh, you're a robot, right? Um, which maybe that's helpful. I, I'm sure there's tech, there's maybe the Gates Foundation likes that. I don't know. Um, so how do we think about teaching responsibility for ourselves and each other? I think this is a piece I want us to think about. So I want to offer with our last 10 minutes of time, um, three possible pathways forward of, of ways that I think we can think through some of these challenges, right? We looked at Hunger Games, we looked at the Mirror Bear said, uh, we looked at some exchanges with, with people in blogging and on Twitter, I want to think through ways that I've been thinking through some, some positive kind of pop ways that we can think about this work, right? The first is something called connected learning, right? Um, which is also the, the theme of today's conference, right? So connected learning, uh, when, you, when you have this capitalized connected learning, comes from the Digital Media and Learning uh, uh, Initiative from the MacArthur Foundation. Um, and essentially, we can look at something like Minecraft as an example, right? Um, young people, when they play Minecraft outside of schools, um, it kind of follows all of these different kinds of pieces of engagement, right? It is production centered. You are making stuff either within Minecraft or about Minecraft, maybe a video tutorial for your colleagues. Um, it's peer supported, you're learning with each other. It's interest powered, this is because you actually want to do it. It's openly networked, you can engage and share this information with other people. You're all doing this work because of, you have the shared purpose, but at the end of the day, it is academically oriented. There's some powerful academic learning outcomes tied to Minecraft um, that we can think about. This whole framework, uh, created by Mimi Ito and, and her colleagues, uh, primarily at UC Irvine, um, really points to the kinds of ways that powerful learning is oftentimes happening outside of schools, and the ways we can think about what it means within schools, right? So, we could look at fan communities on Ravelry, for example, um, a knitting website. I don't knit, so I get to look at Ravelry for research, that's what I get to do. Um, and we can think about, you know, what do these opportunities mean for young people, what are the affordances within it. I published an ebook called Teaching in the Connected Learning Classroom. Um, it is free. You can buy it for 99 cents on Amazon. I don't know why you do that. Um, but if you Google teaching in the Connected Learning Classroom, you will download a free ebook. Um, and this book was, a, in, in my view, as a political response to say, hey, instead of telling teachers what, what you need to do in classrooms, here's what teachers are already doing with Connected Learning. And it's just a series of vignettes that represents the kind of powerful work that happens in the classrooms. Um, from K through 12, as well as out of school museum classes as well. I would, I would encourage you to, uh, again, I won't, I won't prop it up, I don't know who gets that 99 cents even if you did buy it, uh, but I would encourage you to take a look at uh, what other people in our profession are doing with connected learning. Um, another possible pathway forward, uh, I think, is games, right? Um, this is a deck of cards that I usually bring with me called the Game of Phones. Uh, anyone played the Game of Phones? Um, it's like awesome, nice work. It's like. Um, it's like Cards Against Humanity. Uh, actually, we'll play it really quickly, I think. We have, yeah, we're gonna play it really quickly. Um, so look to the three, three or four people around you that you've been talking with or pretend to not make eye contact with if they're still there, so you have to talk to them. Um, what I want you to do is show your app of shame to each other and then quickly decide who the winner is, right? So just quickly show off your app of shame with people around you uh, and, and you have one minute to do it, so do it very quickly.
So I'm all for embarrassing apps. Um, I have on my phone, oh, this is really embarrassing. I have the Marty Pro app, uh, which is where you can take a picture and put Marty and the dog in that picture with you. Um, cost me 99 cents, I think, for that. That's great. Uh, so, that being said, did anyone hear a pretty good, embarrassing, uh, shameful app that people are proud to, to share with you? No app? Yeah. I think the interesting was not that always the app, but how we used it that was the shame part. Uh huh. Like, but I way overused Pinterest. Oh, okay. Or I'm going to explain that. Awesome. Okay. Uh, also, I will say the, star, the official Star Wars app is a marketing thing. They have really good emoji and gifts that you can just send to other people. I send them all the time. Right? I mainly send Chewbacca yelling at people. Uh, it's really helpful. Anyone else here? In, uh, in, yeah. Um, I had a workout app uh, called Seven that has a shameful part of it is I never opened it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I have those apps. They're like, oh, you should download this app. You download it. And it just goes in an extra window of stuff. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. One more embarrassing app over here. Yeah. Authentic weather. Uh, wait, what? Authentic weather. What does that mean? Every time it reports the weather, it's very rude, explicative, <laughs> but really right on. <laughs> Note to self, gonna have to download authentic weather after that. It's great. Thank you. Usually I get a good recommendation on this. I, people had like a, the Papa John's app, you know, just like random stuff to make sure you know, good times. Ask your students what, what their app of shame is, right? So the game of phones, it's essentially just a deck of cards with these kinds of questions, right? What's the last picture you took before we started playing this game? Um, the first person who gets a like on Facebook or Twitter um, wins this card. Just really simple things. Not all of them are work appropriate for school, so I would go through and not just randomly draw from the deck, maybe screen out a couple of cards. Um, it's a good either pub game, bar game, um, but I think there's also some useful ways to use this, use this in terms of building a community within your classroom, right? Um, there's nothing quite like, I, I will do this with my college students, uh, and the kinds of apps of shame that my students have makes me worried sometimes. Uh, but it's a good icebreaker, great. So the reason I like playing games, I use a lot of research around games, is for two, there's two assumptions I have around uh, gaming, and video games in particular, right? The first is, there's powerful learning opportunities in digital games. Uh, and when you think about the kinds of complexity in a game like World of Warcraft, right? Again, as a researcher, I get to read lots of books about World of Warcraft. I don't actually get to play it, uh, but I get to look at pictures like this and talk about what literacy construction means for young people, right? We can look at something like EVE Online, um, which has these huge kind of global battles uh, and they have to slow time down uh, to 10% time in order to like, make sure people can make informed decisions. Um, when you think about civic demonstrations and protests in spaces like MySpace and The Sims, um, we can think about Minecraft again. Minecraft is so complex, people have made working calculators within Minecraft because of programming opportunities. Um, which, so here's the thing that keeps me up at night, is Minecraft is complex enough where you can build a computer within Minecraft which means you could someday build a computer in Minecraft that runs Minecraft inside of Minecraft. And then I just have to lay down for a while and contemplate what that is. Um, but my other assumption is that people can be pretty terrible to one another in online spaces and video games, right? And I think about Gamergate, and I think about the kinds of responses that, that um, particularly feminist journalists have gotten around Gamergate, and I think about the responsibility that we have with games, right? We have a lot, we have a lot of stuff where we talk about how great video games are for learning, and I agree with that, right? But I also want us to be critical about the ways that we're thinking about video gaming, um, and the spaces around us. And so I'm interested primarily right now uh, in games that aren't digital as ways to think through our digital pathways forward, right? So uh, I think about this quote from Alice Waters, who's the farm to table chef uh, from the West Coast. Um, she writes, she's, this quote is, the table is a civilizing place. It's where a group comes and they hear points of view. They learn about courtesy and kindness. They learn about what it is to live in a community. Live in a family first, but live in a bigger community. That's where it comes from, don't you think? Um, this is from Twilight Los Angeles. It's a documentary play about the Los Angeles riots, and this is a quote from Alice Waters within that play. And I think it's useful for us to think through what, how are our classrooms set up like the table? How do we create this kind of community and socializing place where we're able to talk with one another? Right? Um, the Quiet Year, I think, is a good uh, tabletop game. It's a deck of cards, again. People basically build an island map, and they talk about the resources that are on that map, and they just kind of build it out over, over an hour or two times. Right? This is like an aisle, uh, 
with an abundance of human formula and sort of um, end up playing this with poets and poets are some real out there thinkers when, when we create the quiet here. Uh, this was a game jam at the Critical Design and Gaming School. Students spend two days either building video games or board games, and at the end they're able to share the games they're creating. This is a zombie game. Um, so again, I think games are powerful. Um, the last path I forward is, is uh, I would say, we need to build a wobble. Uh, this comes from that text post wobble flow uh, that Bill mentioned. Um, my, I think I'm a follow-up session after this, and I'm primarily going to talk around the kind of framework of post wobble flow, as well as engage in whatever conversation folks want to talk about. Um, but I'll just give a sneak. This is the, if you don't come and don't read the book, here, here are the two things you'll need to know about it, right? First thing is, uh, if we think about the role of teachers and, the, and professional development, it's not like this, right? You don't start out as a novice, and then at the end you're a master teacher, right? And this is what my student teachers think the teaching profession is like, right? Instead, it's more like this, right? It's just all over the place, right? When we think about the ways our mastery um, changes over time, I think mastery is a problematic word. We can think about how we, we're in the profession, we're always kind of wobbling with our positionality and what we're getting better at and what we're struggling with. Right, right, and so I really wrote this book uh, with my colleague Cindy to think through if the numbers are that half of our teachers leave in the first five years of the profession, what are we doing to sustain them? Right, how do we keep people as lifelong teachers in a time when we particularly need them? Right, in today's kind of context, right? Um, and knowing that the other part is that culture and our profession are constantly in flux, things are always changing, right? And knowing things are always changing, right, we can't stay neutral. Um, as, as the train is always moving forward, right, to use the famous quote, right? There is no neutrality uh, within the teaching profession. I oftentimes hear from teachers who say, I, I hear that you're talking about this critical stuff and you think it's important, but I just want to be very objective within my classroom. There is no objectivity, right? We need to be able to have very clear stances because when you don't have a stance, that is a stance, right? And that's the other part I want to think about, right? And so to think about how the world's changing, right, let's think about this quote again from the beginning of the talk that I also um, shared. Uh, I think it's, it's in the program, maybe. Uh, the sky above the port was the color of television tuned to a dead channel, right? When William Gibson wrote this in 1984, the dead channel was the kind of what I called the ants racing um, sky humdrum color, right? It was the gray color, right? But if you tune to a dead channel in 2016, if you turn a TV and it's not connected to a, a cable, it is a beautiful sky <laughs> blue, right? And we think about the ways that you read this famous science fiction novel today, that first sentence means something fundamentally di different to you as a reader, right? That dead channel is a, you're like, oh, it's a beautiful day outside. And the context of how we read and the context of the world around us is constantly changing, right? I want to think about the diverse journeys that we're going on. I want to end by thinking about the ship of Theseus, right? Or the Theseus paradox might be another way that people refer to this. Um, so Theseus uh, has escaped from the labyrinth, has returned home to Athens, um, and is celebrated as a hero, right? Uh, he's gone on this great heroic journey, and now he's here to return back and kind of, people are gonna herald the, the heroics of who he was. And so to keep his ship in the harbor as a testament to Athenian strength and will. Right? It just stays there. Um, and for years it stays there. Years and years, people, every time they see it, it's a reminder of how great Theseus is. Um, but after, you know, after 10 years, for example, um, one of the planks in the ship starts to rot, so they pull it out, they replace it, ship's still good, they set it to the side. A couple years later, another ship, another point rots, they, they take it out and they put it to the side. Um, again and again they do this. Over many, many years, this pile has grown so gigantic. Okay. This, this pile has grown so gigantic um, that you could essentially build a brand new ship outside from the pile of wood next to the ship of Theseus. And you could build two identical ships, and there's the, the Theseus paradox is this idea of which is the real ship, right? Museum people have thought about this in terms of um, if they might be restoring an axe, there's a famous book called The Same Axe Twice. Um, they might end up with two axes from the result of restoring and kind of preserving uh, one axe through museum processes. Um, when you think through which axe is correct, right? And I think about all of the kinds of reform and initiatives we're doing, right? Maybe your classroom has one-to-one uh, -one iPads or Chromebooks um, or netbooks or whatever you want to call them in your classroom. Maybe you're using digital devices. Maybe you have a, maybe you have a smart board. Um, maybe you have an LCD projector, which has replaced uh, a whiteboard, which has replaced an overhead projector, which has replaced a blackboard. Um, and all of these things ultimately, at what point does the ship that we've built Right? Essentially, recreate the same inequalities as the ships that we built before us. Right? How are we recreating the same inequalities over and over in the teaching profession? 
right? And at the end of the day, what is the response of it? What is the responsibility of educators around all of this stuff that we care? Right? We're no longer in an era of no child left behind. We have this other problematic thing. And I think it'll be different too, soon too, right? How are we constantly changing all of this stuff? And who's steering the ship, right? Our responsibility as educators is to think through who's, who's driving the work that we're doing in our classrooms and what are the, what's the best interest of those people, right? Here's the questions I want us to think about and I'd be happy to have this conversation probably on Twitter um, or during lunch or something. Um, what journey are your students embarking on? How are you safely stewarding and supporting their agency in these travels? Right? Our responsibility as adults. And how are your actions supporting a loving, humanizing ethos with your class, within your classroom and profession? Right? I think we have this responsibility both to our students and to the other educators, both that we work with now and that will come after us. Right? How are your actions supporting a loving, humanizing ethos? Right? I don't think we talk about love and humanity as much as a profession. I think that's a responsibility that we have. Uh, this is my contact information. Uh, thank you very much, I really appreciate it. I'll see you all do the rest of the day. starting at 1 p.m. Um, you can go to the vendor area throughout the day and there's ushers there to answer your questions if you have any questions about anything that's going on today. And your first session starts at 10.20. Have a great day.